Now let's look at the pathophysiology underlying congestive heart failure. Now by pathophysiology, we mean the disease process behind the condition. How do we get from a normal heart to congestive heart failure? Now this is a very broad topic because any pathology of the heart and the cardiopulmonary system can potentially lead to CHF eventually. But first, let's just quickly draw the diagram of the cardiovascular system again. So we have our four chambers of the heart. Remember that deoxygenated blood goes from the body to the heart, then to the lungs, and then oxygenated blood is pumped to the body by the left ventricle. Now heart failure can be broken down into two categories. You have your left and right. Left heart failure is when the left ventricle cannot properly pump blood forward. This primarily results in backup into the lungs, causing pulmonary edema. If you get an x-ray of the lungs, it will look white and fluffy from all the extra fluid, and our patient will be short of breath. And then there's right heart failure. Remember that the most common cause of right heart failure is left heart failure, because it eventually backs up into the right. The primary symptoms here are edema in the body and distended jugular veins. Isolated right heart failure usually points to a problem in the lungs, actually, because that's the next step to go after the right ventricle. In this video, let's begin with the pathophysiologies of left heart failure. Now, the first important ideology um, that is especially common in our country is hypertension or increased blood pressure. Now, blood pressure correlates with the resistance in the systemic blood vessels, and this is the pressure that the left ventricle has to push against for each pump. In other words, the pressure in the blood vessels are pushing back, and we think of this as roughly the left ventricle's workload, and we call it afterload. Now, over time, chronic hypertension increases the afterload day after day, year after year, and the heart is a muscle, so like any other muscle in the body, it's going to get bigger with more work. So chronic hypertension leads to what we call left ventricular hypertrophy, which literally means the left ventricle gets bigger. Now you might think, how is this a bad thing? Bigger heart, stronger heart? But the pump is not built to work that way. The hypertrophy chamber gets stiff, it gets scarred and doesn't fill up as well, and eventually becomes ineffective at its job of pumping blood. And this gives us heart failure. Next, we have dilated cardiomyopathy, which means the left ventricle gets stretched out and floppy. As you can imagine, this makes it less efficient at pumping up blood. So think of what happens when you blow up a balloon too far and you damage the strength of the stretchy material and it won't have as much force to clamp back down. That's roughly how dilated cardiomyopathy looks. Some causes of this include alcohol abuse, drug abuse, um, both recreational and prescribed medication use, some viruses like Coxsackie B virus, hemochromatosis, and when you get a chest x-ray, you can actually see the enlarged left ventricle. A third big category of pathophysiology leading to heart failure is ischemic heart disease, which is also common in our country. Ischemia means lack of oxygenated blood. As you know, the body and the muscles in particular need a constant supply of oxygen. The heart gets its blood supply from the coronary arteries, which wrap the heart in this elaborate network, but for simplicity's sake, I'll just draw it like this. Over time, with high cholesterol and plaque built up, these arteries will get clogged, and the lumen becomes narrower. So the heart muscles are getting less fresh blood and can become starved for oxygen. We're all familiar with the worst case scenario for ischemic heart disease, which is myocardial infarction, or heart attack. When we get all the way to infarction, the tissue has died from sudden complete blockage of the coronary arteries. Often, if a person survives an MI and we open their coronary arteries back up with a stent, the muscles that suffer the injury won't completely recover, and they'll still end up with some level of heart failure. But of course, before we even get to the point of having an MI, ischemia itself can also lead to varying degrees of heart failure, as the oxygen-starved muscles are ineffective at contracting and pushing blood. The last big category we'll talk about today is restrictive cardiomyopathy, which means the heart is not expanding enough to receive the blood. Before we can pump blood out, we have to receive it into the heart first. Again, think of trying to put water in a balloon. It's supposed to be able to stretch a little as the water fills it, right? So what happens if our balloon becomes stiff? 
then we can't put as much water in it. This leads to what we call diastolic dysfunction in the heart. Now, systole is when the ventricles are pumping blood out, and diastole is the other phase when the ventricles are relaxed and being filled. And in each cardiac cycle or each bottom, we have one systole and one diastole. If we have diastolic dysfunction, less blood is in the ventricles each time it contracts. So, of course, we won't have as much blood being pumped out, leading to heart failure. And one common cause of this is amyloidosis, which is deposit of proteins that can happen anywhere in the body. But when it happens in the heart, I think of it as having sand rubbed into the muscles, making them stiff and not as relaxed to receive blood during diastole. Now these are some of the most common pathophysiologies of left heart failure. Next, we'll talk about right heart failure and eventually how to think about treating congestive heart failure.